Good morning, everybody. My name is Kim Pittaway. Um, I am uh, an, a, a teacher, a journalist, an editor. Uh, I've spent uh, most of my career uh, in, in working in the magazine world in some form or another. So I worked as a freelance writer for much of my career, uh, transitioned uh, to the editing side, was the editor-in-chief at Chatelaine magazine. Uh, and when I left Chatelaine, uh, transitioned back to freelancing and teaching and consulting. So. These days, I do a lot of teaching, uh, I do some consulting, uh, and I don't do as much writing and editing as I would like to do, so, so that's part of the mix. Um, this morning, we're gonna spend time talking about social media display writing in particular, so headlines, uh, subject lines, that sort of thing, uh, geared to attracting eyeballs and clicks to your content. Um, the content that I'm going to cover this morning is based on uh, my experience, but also on research into what the current best practices are, what other people are getting results with. So we'll talk about that, but the, the way I like to frame this is it's like weight loss ads. Your results may vary, okay? So what works for somebody else's site uh, may or may not work for your site and your content. And so the best learning that you're going to do is learning from what has worked and is working for you. But there are some broad uh, principles that we can apply along the way. So um, start out with the cacophony of advice that you know your stuff should be long, no it should be short, there should be numbers, no you should use emojis, you should have exclamation marks but it should be an odd number of exclamation marks because an even number of exclamation marks doesn't work as well. Uh, it should be camel case which means that you uh, capitalize the first letter of each word and then other people will say no well, sometimes you should do all caps or sometimes you should do sentence case. You should pack it with keywords, you should focus on the emotional punch, you should be positive, except that negative really works really well as we know in the world today. So, and you should tease them with clickbait and bait and switch and all of that kind of stuff. So there's just this cacophony of conflicting advice. And the reality is that some of that advice works some of the time and some of it doesn't work other times and it really is, again, about figuring out what works best for you, for your brand, for the kind of content that you're, you're developing. So we're gonna spend the next couple of hours sort of working through six key areas. Uh, we're gonna scan what the latest wisdom is on you know, what has worked for others, what's worked in big sample sizes uh, for other major brands. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what you're finding works for you and your content. Talk a little bit about looking at the uh, various platforms and what works in different cases. I'm going to focus mostly on Facebook and Twitter, uh, as well as e-newsletter and your own website headlines. Um, but you can certainly apply many of those insights to other, uh, other social media platforms. We'll talk a little bit about targeting your audience, and I've included the bracket S there because we all have more than one audience. We have audience segments, so understanding how targeting content to specific audience segments can be valuable. Talk a little bit as well about nailing your voice and tone. What is your brand's voice? What are the parameters of that voice? How does that voice shift in its tone, and what is the difference between voice and tone? and then some resources to help you build your muscles along the way. Um, you've got at your uh, places uh, one handout that is just a, a bit of a summary of some of the content we're going to cover. There's a lot more content uh, on the slides, but I will make the slide set available through Sylvia so you'll be able to get the slide set as well. Um, I will tell you all the research though says that if you take notes, you'll retain it better. Um, so that's why I don't provide the slide set in advance. Uh, but Sylvia will be able to, to share the slide set with you too. Um, okay, so we're going to start with scanning the latest wisdom. So what do they say work? So it's the, you know, the amorphous they of, of a real range of sources and wisdom. Um, but one of the uh, acronyms that I'm, you know, I couldn't have worked in women's magazines for as long as I did without uh, developing some affinity for an acronym, right? Uh, one of the acronyms that I find useful is SHINE, make it shine. So when you're looking at creating 
social media display content. Think about how you can make it specific, how you can make it helpful, how you can make it immediate, newsworthy, and entertaining. And we're going to dig a little bit deeper on each one of those. OK, so what do we mean when we say specific? You want to use concrete details in your display writing, so, and particularly details that can help us form pictures in our mind. If we can see some of what you're saying in that sentence or in that headline or in that line, that helps us to grasp the information more efficiently. So think about concrete details. Layer in specific names or places, important uh, um, speci specific names and places where it makes sense to do so. And you want that display content generally to be as uh, simple or direct as possible. This you know, makes all of us who love puns cry a little bit, uh, because we'd all much rather have more fun in, in what has been a long tradition of magazine and print headline and display writing, which is creating a display copy that, that is more suggestive than uh, completely clear and, and um, uh, yeah, the, 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 the stuff that is more, headlines and decks that are, are more, um, uh, yeah, more suggestive than, than immediately direct. Uh, whereas online in particular, you really need to back away from some of the wordplay. You can still work some of that in, but you really need to ask yourself the key question is, am I being clear? And I like this term, high information sent. You know, is there enough information in what you're writing so that the reader can grasp whether or not they're going to be interested in clicking through on this content and reading further? The high information sent also helps your SEO because if there's high information sent, if there's clear, if there's clear content delivered in your display copy, that's going to help your SEO along the way. So uh, I pulled an example from uh, one of the sites, I think it's in the room, uh, one of the dance sites. This was just from their website. So this is a good example of specific content, right? The Royal Winnipeg, it's a, a promising pair, okay, it, that's uh, not as specific as it could be, but it's followed immediately up with the Royal Winnipeg Ballet's new second soloist, and it gives their full name. So that that's going to help drive your SEO because you've got the proper name of the organization, the proper name of the two key people that you're talking about. So looking, that clarity really helps. So watch the length on all of your display copy, whether you're thinking about um, e-newsletter subject lines, whether you're thinking about headlines and e-newsletters, headlines on your website, social media content. Watch the length. People generally scan a block of copy and their eye catches most, their eye latches onto generally the first three and the last three words. So you can certainly go over six words in total, but you're going to want to make sure that you're conveying some good key information in those first three and last three words. Wherever you can personalize the content, uh, it makes sense to do so. And I don't mean personalizing it to me, Kim, or to Jen, or to, you know, to, to a specific person necessarily, but target it and personalize it to the segment of your audience that is unique and the segment that you are speaking to. And by that, I mean things like, uh, if you are doing uh, con uh, an e-newsletter for teachers, framing stuff as seven things only teachers understand about September, that is personalized to your particular audience. So again, creating some kind of obvious connection between the content and the person who's on the receiving end of the content. Five things journalists need to know about online security. On a journalist site, that's the kind of content that speaks directly to that audience. So think about ways to personalize it. And this is a, 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 an example from uh, Langara Publishing that I thought was interesting because they're appealing to their particular student group with this. 
So the, the tweet is, this how-to diagram by publishing student Jeremy Ray has an important message, Fi and then they're following it up with a call to action. Find out about the 12-month publishing diploma program and a link here. So they're, they're showing content that one of their students created, so you're getting a sense of, oh, I could create something like that. The content within, you know, the, the, the actual subject matter of that content is the kind of content that might appeal to their target audience and they're including a direct call to action in that tweet as well, right, or in that uh, post. So, you know, you're getting all of those layers uh, baked in. So helpful, H for helpful. Can you solve a problem for your audience? And think about what kinds of problems they're trying to solve. Um, I had a conversation yesterday in a consultation with one of BC Mag's members, and we were talking about um, the challenge and sometimes frustration of circling back to certain kinds of content regularly because, you know, it's uh, it's October, we have to do pumpkin carving. It's uh, you know, it's uh, January, we have to do weight loss. It's I don't know, when, do the, when does the uh, World Series happen? It's November, the World Series, October, whatever it is. Uh, we have to do World Series related stuff. And there's a little bit of boredom that happens in an editorial team in cycling around to those sort of annual markers. But for your audience, those annual markers actually are important to them. And it's figuring out what are the annual beats that you need to hit for your particular audience. There is some seasonality to every audience segment. And so thinking about what the seasonality is for your particular audience segment uh, and delivering content annually for that kind of content, for that kind of audience. And that also gives you an opportunity to, to circle back and resurface content from past years. So, you know, you can, for instance, um, if I were doing a university publication or a university website, there might be a particular time of year where I'm going to always focus on mental health stuff because, you know, you've gotten through the, uh, the optimism, September, the most optimistic month of the year, and now you're into November, the reality of midterm marks, and everybody's just slogging it through till December, right? So maybe November is always, for your audience, going to be the time when you do some mental health stuff. And the challenge is to find ways to freshen up that mental health content so you're not delivering exactly the same thing every year, but you are recognizing that your audience has that need every year, even if you may be getting a little bit bored with it. Uh, the, the challenge is for you to freshen it up so that it delivers good, strong content. So think about what kinds of problems your audience is seeking to solve, what kinds of problems they try to solve over the course of a year, but also what kind of problems they're trying to solve in more immediate terms. Um, what is motivating them right now? What's keeping them awake at night? Uh, what would help them sleep a little bit easy, more easily? How can you help solve some of those problems for them? Also think about what motivates people to share content because you, while you want people to click on your specific content, you also absolutely want them to share that content, right? So think about what motivates your audience to share. In general terms, um, people share because they want to help each other out. They, should, they share because they want to help uh, make somebody else's mood better often. Um, although in the world that we live in now, so if I were doing this presentation two years ago, I would have said, always tip in the direction of positive. The world that we live in today, where there is more fear and more anxiety in the air, you will definitely see that some of those scarier caution, concern, anxiety driven content will generate lots of clicks as well. It's gonna be up to you on a brand by brand basis to think about what the right balance between positive, realistic anxiety is in the mix of your content, okay? Um, but you will see that generally 
uh, people will share things that lighten the mood a little bit. So if you could imagine your headline being preceded by the word wow with an exclamation mark, that's kind of the kind of content that, that people will share. So they'll share you know, the content of the three whales doing a breach off the coast of Nova Scotia for the whale watching folks because it's amazing video and it brings a moment of lightness and, and happiness into everybody's life. So that's the kind of thing that you as an individual will probably share on your Facebook page with just the comment, wow. So that kind of content gets shared. Content that also helps people, um, alerts people to danger or concern will also get shared. So that's on the, on the, on the anxiety side of things. It's also interesting that people share content to project a certain kind of image of themselves, okay? So it's worth doing some thinking about what the psychological drivers, what the psychographics are of your readership. Um, you know, are there, and what the segments are. We're gonna talk a little bit about that when we get into audience. But, you know, what, what kinds of things are driving your audience? Uh, are your readers motivated by the desire to be the smartest person at the water cooler at work? Are they the kind of uh, folks who are motivated by wanting to be able to share the latest tips uh, on parenting because they know how to do this and everybody else doesn't? Um, you know, so what is motivating your readership? And understanding that will help you to package content in a way that connects with them more effectively. So, this is a, I, I find this a helpful uh, way to think about the construction of some of, uh, to, to think about the construction of a certain kind of headline or, uh, or tweet. So, take, use that construction. How? Insert the mundane task of your, uh, of your, uh, of your wish. How blank does blank. So how cleaning your fridge helps fight flu. How better note taking boosts your marks. So taking something that we don't necessarily want to do, but there is some benefit in it. So are there ways to sort of formulate some of your content? That's a really, that's the kind of headline that is communicating an immediate direct benefit. And the twist in it is by taking that mundane task, that thing that we don't really want to do, and prom making that promise that it actually delivers some unexpected benefit along the way. <clears throat> so on the immediacy front, is the content that you're sharing timely? And is there some way for you to communicate that? So uh, is it that you communicate it by saying breaking news? Is it that you communicate it by including a deadline or uh, some other kinds of words that signal urgency or timeliness in your uh, display copy? Recognize as well that just triggering someone's curiosity boosts immediacy, okay? So if you make someone curious, they're going to feel an internal uh, urgency to clicking on that to answer the question. So, so triggering curiosity boosts immediacy, even if there isn't a specific time element attached to your content. So, and this is a very simple example from pulp literature. Uh, Hummingbird flash fiction contest closes June 15th. So they've included a specific date so that they're communicating the immediacy, the deadline attached to this content. Um, you will note that they've also used an image. Uh, images also help uh, in Twitter and Facebook in, uh, in creating a connection with readers. You don't always have to have an image, but the image certainly does help. So N for newsworthy. Can you signal that the content is newsworthy in some way? So is it, what is it about what you're publishing that is new news? If you, one of the challenges for, for publications that cover a certain particular beat or a particular story repeatedly is conveying the difference in this story from the one you published yesterday or the one you published last week. So you want to take a look at, it's always useful to do, before you write your headline for the new story on 
whatever, uh, you know, the, the latest story on the pipeline um, to do a quick scan of what your headlines on the pipeline have been over the course of the last month so that you're not falling into repeating the same rhythm of headline or the same construction of headline uh, so that your reader feels like they're getting something new and fresh. So do a quick scan of what headlines you've used or what display copy, social media copy you've used related to this content in the past. The other piece that people often fall into is, is labeling content rather than signaling the context that you are able to deliver to content. So can you provide a why or a how or a what behind a headline? So for instance, it's the difference between doing a straight kind of news take on Pakistan's right to information laws criticized. That's a straight news take, okay? But if you can frame that as how Pakistan's right to information laws work and why they often don't, now you're providing context, you're providing expl explanation, you're promising your reader that you're going to take them uh, someplace deeper than just the same headline that everybody else can deliver. You're signaling your authority there, uh, you're signaling that you have a depth of understanding about that particular topic that others may not. So look for ways to signal authority, to signal context, and a signal explanation. And a couple more examples of this. So this is a, a headline on a piece, uh, Ori Okolo Mwangi, the Kenyan pundit. Well, that's a label, right? That's, that's just a label more than a headline. If you frame that as how Ori Okolo Mwangi became Kenya's democracy watchdog, now you're telling me a story, right? Now you're telling me a story of how she moved through and became uh, this 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 uh, beacon in her home country. So you're moving from just giving me a label for someone to actually conveying that you're going to tell me some kind of story, take me on some kind of journey, provide some kind of explanation. Don't focus on events, focus on the, the implications. So this comes back to context and explanation again. So a headline, and another blow for free speech, Egypt's parliament passes cybercrime law. Okay, you're telling me a little bit there, it's a blow to free speech, but you're not exactly telling me how. But really the information in that headline is that Egypt has passed a cybercrime law. Well, if, I know, if I'm following that kind of material, I probably know that that has happened, or I've seen that headline in a bunch of other places. But if you can say Egypt's new cybercrime law makes censorship easier and blogging more dangerous, again, you're providing me with context, you're providing me with explanation, uh, you're telling me that you're going to focus on the implications of what has happened rather than just on the factual um, content of what has happened. Also, and I mentioned this earlier with seasonality, but it applies to newsworthiness as well, Look for opportunities to resurface past stories that will provide context or background on new stories, okay? So if you're doing your 15th piece on pipelines and you have a really great explainer that you ran three weeks ago or three months ago, link that back into your current content or tweet it out or uh, post it on Facebook um, as, uh, you know, sort of latest headline on pipelines, check out our explainer where we tell you everything you need to know about X. So you can resurface that content because it's still valuable to the reader even though it's an older piece. Uh, make it clear, the key there so that your reader will not feel sort of tricked into clicking on old content is to be transparent. Uh, to say, you know, how this is linked to that current headline. Check out the explainer we did last month that tells you everything about why. So you're being transparent with your reader. Last uh, in the SHINE acronym, be entertaining. So entertaining doesn't mean that you have to be lightweight, it doesn't mean you have to be glib, it doesn't mean you have to make a terrible pun, although I'm a huge fan of terrible puns in real life, not so much on social media and online. But I can be entertained by a smart way of packaging a story. I can be entertained by an unexpected image 
or an interesting association between the image that you've posted. I can be entertained by uh, an interesting uh, or amusing sort of take on a story. But you want to make sure that you don't let the entertainment value get in the way of clarity. It's a challenging kind of game to play. But as you work at it and ask yourself at each point, am I being clear, I think you will, you'll develop some muscles to know what's entertaining for your particular audience. Okay, some other tips. Can you newsjack? I just like that frame, newsjacking. Uh, what I mean by that is can something that you're doing be piggybacked or related to another current hot topic? So um, is there a way for you to relate something in your content, in your, in your area, to another news story? That creates immediacy. That creates newsworthiness. Uh, that creates um, value for your reader if there's a way to connect it. I would caution you um, not to, to watch for tone on that stuff. So um, we've all seen the bad social media examples of the past where uh, thinking of um, the hurricane that came up the west, uh, the east coast uh, four or five years ago where in some, uh, Hurricane Sandy, where in some areas it just was a little bit of rain and people got the day off and in other areas people's lives were devastated. And there were a handful of social media brands that tweeted, hey, got the day off work because of the storm? Here, come shop at whatever. And, you know, hit a really ugly note because people, some people were losing their homes in the mix. So, you, yes, you want to newsjack, do it cautiously um, and don't, I would exercise caution in trying to lighten up a serious news story. Uh, you want to approach that kind of news jacking with uh, some caution and with a certain level of, of um, gravitas that you're, that you're not making light of something that may be disastrous for somebody else, okay? So posts with high emotional value get more share. So that's what I was talking about, the wow, but also some of the caution stuff. You need to think about what kinds of emotions work well for your brand along the way. And what's the right emotional level for your publication, for your website, for your brand. Um, think about, <clears throat> it's useful to sort of go through uh, a whole list of emotional uh, words that describe different emotions and think about which ones of those are appropriate for your brand and to really go deep on them. So I use the, the uh, when, when people are talking about, oh, we want our site, we want our content to be funny. Well, what does that mean? Do you want it to be sarcastic? Do you want it to be wisecracking? Do you want it to be gently humorous? Do you want it to be, uh, you know, uh, witty? All of those are variations on funny. So do a bit of a deep dive on what the, the, the right emotional uh, tenor for your particular content and site is and, and really dive into some of those words a little bit so that you're refining what the right tone and voice is and we'll get a little bit more towards that, uh, about that later in the, the presentation. So here's uh, one that I thought uh, pr connected, uh, and it's from Story Hive. So Throwback Thursday from last week. In World War II, Lethbridge, Alberta housed 12,000 German prisoners of war brought over from Britain. What could have been a brutal and adversarial experience became a surprising example of human decency and cooperation. Cooperation. So you see they've got 73 shares and 3.8 thousand uh, views at the point that I grabbed that. Um, so you know, there's an emotional button that is pushed here, right? There's an emotional button, first of all, nostalgia. There's an emotional button about looking back at events, historical events from the past. But there's also, uh, I think, a, a, a note that is hit here about hopefulness, 
about decency and cooperation in a challenging time. God, why would that resonate with us? I have no idea. Um, you know, so so there's a sort of a, a, a an emotional resonance there that I think is probably that probably helped to drive this story forward. Do you guys want to say anything about about that particular post or what worked or didn't work about it? Uh. <laughs> is there a backstory? Maybe this is. A <laughs> Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh. Okay, sorry. Um, we do a thing most Thursdays of the month where we do a throwback to um, historical yeah. videos that we make. Um, They're pined in our library. Um, yeah. So we like, yeah, we try to make use of the content that we already have available. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, just pull some context from, from the videos. Yeah. And so in, in comparison to other stuff that you've posted, how did this perform? Do you have a sense? Yeah, so this, uh, like a, around around the same as a lot of things that perform that we do on these Thursdays, we also, yeah. to be perfectly honest, um, we have a bit of a boosting budget for uh, Facebook, yeah. so that also yeah. helps. Helps as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Facebook, Facebook is a great vessel for videos, so these kinds of things are gonna drive success already yeah. because people just love to, to watch that kind of content on that platform, so. Yeah. All those tools are helpful. Yeah, okay. So there's a lot of stuff coming together for that particular post to help make that a successful post. And you're, I think what's important about that is that you know what's working for you in those kinds of posts. So you're continuing to do those kinds of posts with new content, with fresh content, because it does work for you. So that comes back to <laughs> learning what works for your content and your site. Look for, as you're crafting headlines, as you're crafting uh, uh, posts, as you're crafting um, newsletter subject lines, pit, look for verbs that convey more than, the, the work, look for hardworking verbs, okay? So look for verbs that show conflict, that show motion, that show emotion. So slash, slam, gut. Some of these are standard headline kind of words that we don't necessarily use when we're talking to each other. You don't usually say, wow, you know, Justin Trudeau really slammed, you know, blah, blah, blah. But we do say that in, in display writing. Um, warns, urges, pushes, uh, argues, pleads, praises, applauds. Those are all words that, that, verbs, that do some heavy lifting for you along the way because they're conveying energy, they have some push to them, they have some muscularity to them. So look for verbs that have that kind of, of uh, strength along the way. As I said, polar he headlines do work, as do negative su superlatives and caution words. Uh, it's the standard 5 p.m. Uh, newscast approach. Uh, the killer that lurks in your refrigerator more at 5:30. Um, you know, so of course I'm going to come back to see what the killer that lurks in my refrigerator is. It's probably the blue moldy cheese at the back of the you know second shelf. But those kinds of caution-driven headlines uh, do uh, result in some clicks along the way. Numbers work. So headlines with numerals in them generate more social shares and engagement. And you should use the numeral. Do not spell the number out. Use the numeral, OK? So politico.com did uh, an experiment where they posted the same story uh, with two different headlines within a couple of hours of each other. They acknowledged that there may have been a little bit of difference because of the timing of the post. But the first headline was, what to expect if GOP health care bill fails? It got 1,000 clicks. Two hours later, they posted three things to expect if GOP health care bill fails. It got over 2,400 clicks. OK? So a couple of things working there, right? Saying three things makes it manageable to me. I can hold through. I can, I can live with figure, hearing what three things are. Maybe I don't want to be drowned by nine terrible things that this is going to mean, but three things, OK, I can hold that in my head. So that makes the story seem manageable. It makes it seem quickly readable. It makes it seem like I can hold that information in my head and look smarter when I'm talking to the person in two cubicles over later on. Um, and it is promising explanation. Even though the first headline also promises some explanation, the second one 
is clearer on exactly what form that explanation is going to take and the, the, the shape of that explanation, right? So, you know, framing it in that way, in their case, made a difference of almost uh, three times in the number of clicks uh, generated by that story. <clears throat> Are there ways that you can ask a question and answer it to in your headline? So, why do dogs bark at night? Five dog trainers offer tips that quiet canines. How can you protect your online privacy? Five experts share what works and what doesn't. So again, you're looking, also looking for ways to introduce a little bit of tension into the headline. So what works and what doesn't introduces some tension there. What makes a winning essay? Three TAs share strategies that will really boost your marks. And on that last one, looking for the unexpected expert. Okay, looking for the person who, from a reader's point of view, might really have the inside scoop, but you don't often hear from. The more you know, expected take on that is three profs share strategies. But then, in the university context, we know that the TAs are doing the marking. So you know, three TAs share strategies, now you're getting closer to the ground, closer to the people who are actually making the decisions. Um, you know, if you're doing political stories, looking for ways to, you know, three fixers say what really works, three whatever, you know, that kind of content that communicates to readers, again, your authoritativeness as, uh, as, a, as a channel, as a brand, as a publication. You're getting me closer to the people who really know how things work as opposed to just hearing from the usual suspects again and again. words that work. So this is a random, if you do a Google search for words that work in social media, you'll get a bunch of lists. This is sort of a sampling of some common words across a whole lot of lists. I will say, you know, will the word science always work for you in your headline? Not necessarily. It depends on, again, on your audience. But these are some of the words that show up as common uh, words in clickable heads. Signaling additional content also works. And the way to signal that additional content generally is in square brackets. So if you have a headline and there is video content attached to that story once someone clicks through, just square bracket video after it. Square bracket opinion, square bracket analysis. Those kinds of words uh, signal to the reader that there is additional value to the content and that typically bo boosts click-through rates. We live in a big country. We live in a big world. Your content will be potentially, if you're not a regional publication or brand, your content's going to be getting clicks in different time zones. So consider the time zones when you post. Consider reposting at various times throughout the day. Uh, how much you should repost will vary from platform to platform, uh, and you can certainly find guidance online uh, by looking uh, for um, uh, pieces around you know, t time zone shifting for content, that sort of thing. Um, but you do want to look at where the bulk of your audience is, focus you're posting to that bulk, but also recognize if you've got a heavy concentration of readers in Vancouver and your next biggest audience is Toronto, you're going to want to be doing, doing some dual posting there because you're going to want to hit key times of the day for your audience. And those key times will vary depending on who your audience is, but key times for your audience in both of those time zones, okay? Okay, so general rules on uh, length. Typically headlines in that 55 character range. Email subject lines, you can, you can go much longer on email subject lines, but you want to jam the most important content into those first 50 characters because that's what's going to show on the vast majority of uh, email uh, browsers. Uh, on Facebook posts, typically uh, 100 to 140 characters. Yes, lots of them will be much longer, but again, get your most important stuff into that, into that first section of the post. 
uh, tweets 120 to 130 characters. That's not new news to most folks. Okay, but also recognize that all of those guidelines are based on huge samples. They're based on generalized content. They're also based on content from media sites, from uh, informational sites, and from transactional, so sales sites. So all of that has some impact on making those really generalized numbers. And that is one area where really, truly, your results may vary. Uh, you, what, hap what works well for your website uh, may, may fall outside of those parameters. What works well for your brand may fall outside of those parameters. So watch what's working yourself and do some analysis there. Um, also, all of those stats generally come out of the US, some North America wide. If you are doing content that is geared to other parts of the world, you're going to want to look for specific guidelines for those regions as well. Okay, so all of that, as I've said, what works for major brands, what works for the New York Times, might differ from what works for you. So we, you, know, you need to do some thinking and some analysis of what works for your particular brand. You want to ask yourself what has worked for us in the past, what's working now for us, what's working now for our competitors. Look at what's working in your competitive set as well. Um, and think about what can you measure and what can you test, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we move through. So I want to take a little break to put some of this into action. So I would like you to take a headline from a recent story from your site, from your publication, and I'd like you to try writing uh, three different versions of it and choose from this list. So try a problem solution headline, a how blank does what. Try a headline that focuses on the implications. Think about whether there's some news jacking opportunity. Is there a way for you to increase the immediacy of that headline? Can you boost the specifics? Can you use any of the other strategies that we've talked about uh, in the last 40 minutes or so? So take a look at something from your own material. Uh, or if you don't have a specific example in mind, but you, you're working on a story or have worked on a piece recently, use that as an example and see what you can come up with to hone that a little bit. So we're going to let you spend maybe about three or four minutes doing that, and we'll share some thoughts after that. So Mike's going to come right around from the side. There you go. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I just started working as an associate editor with Link Magazine. And one of the titles they have is just um, Conscious Commuter. And Called? Conscious, Conscious Commuter. OK, Conscious Commuter, OK. And um, it's broken up into three sections. So I just thought it would be better to say maybe three ways to be a conscious commuter, how conscious commuting can help your wallet. Conscious commuter, how to make yourself sound more like an environmental hipster. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it's worth thinking about when you're using a phrase like conscious commuter, that can be an evocative phrase, but it's looking for an opportunity to add a little bit of explanation in the headline, which is, I think, what you were getting at, to, to, to use the word eco and enviro and that sort of thing, helps me say, OK, it's not just I'm going to meditate on my way to work. It's actually, <laughs> you know, because there could be that mindfulness implication of it as well, right? So how do you make sure that there is clarity attached to that? And adding those additional few words makes a huge difference to what otherwise is a little bit puzzling as a headline, right? Yeah. 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 Nicely done. Anybody else want to? I saw you all scribbling. I know you weren't just writing notes to yourself. Yeah, sure. Right here and then over here. So I work for a magazine that focuses on commercial real estate okay. and the marketing of commercial real estate. Yeah. And we always have those seasonal stories, especially heading up into the holidays. Yeah. So one of the headlines was uh, three reasons why your mall still needs sidewalk sales. Okay. Yeah. And the second version of that was your mall's Black Friday sidewalk, sidewalk sales can beat Amazon. Okay. Yeah. So you're making a really clear promise in that second one, right? You're going to the heart of who their big competitor is uh, and, and making a clear promise. The, sec the first one has the nice number layered in there and gets at that 
you've done a nice job of tapping into that lingering question of, oh God, do we have to do a sidewalk sale again? You know, so why that still needs to happen. So you're tweaking that emotional button a little bit and, and layering an explanation to both of them. And the strength of those kinds of headlines comes out of knowing your audience really well, right? Comes out of knowing what is keeping them up at night. Do we have to do another effing sidewalk sale? Uh, you know, uh, what is keeping them up at night? Amazon is keeping them up at night, you know? Uh, people coming in and price shopping and then going and looking for it online instead. Uh, so looking for, tapping into those key worries and key concerns, but offering some clear benefit. So nicely done on those. And then over here. Hi, so um, I'm with Pulp Literature Magazine. Yeah. So uh, we do fiction. So there's not a lot of immediacy, yeah. but I chose the, um, a recent headline was uh, Raven Contest Closes Soon. Uh, so uh, one of the ones I did uh, would to add some numbers was uh, don't miss your chance to win $300 in publication. Yeah. So that's immediacy and numbers. And benefit, uh, and really benefit, benefit, yeah. Um, or another version, the Raven contest closes in three days. Um, and then to try and news jack, I, I couldn't actually find anything from the judge, but you know, this would work for other contests if you know if we had a blog post from him, uh, which we didn't get. But <laughs> uh, Raven contest judge C.C. Humphrey on what makes him turn the page. Yeah. Excellent. So you're providing people with actionable information that they can then use in, in making their submission. The other thing that's interesting about, I think, literature publications, um, there are ways to newsjack by getting at, getting at the emotional, um, getting at the looking for the opportunities to provide emotional insight or character insight. So for instance, um, you know, at a time when everyone was talking about Kavanaugh south of the border, if you had, uh, if you could sort of dip back into your archive of, of uh, three, three male characters who made shitty decisions or made poor decisions in their lives along the way, you know, what, or, or three turning point stories or three stories of, of women who stood up, you know, so you're again, you're sort of taking that news hook and you're providing some linkage and the benefit to your reader is that fiction helps illuminate all kinds of processes, the process of transformation, care issues of character, all of that kind of thing. And there could be really interesting opportunities to, you know, sort of learn and provide insight based on how other characters act in similar transformational moments. So that can be an interesting way to news jack in if, in content that isn't necessarily directly about the news, but provides insight into the motivations of the characters underneath that news. So that's worth thinking about. So a lot of times I know that in the rush and hustle of the day, what we end up doing is we write the headline and we do one version of it <laughs> and we write it and send it and get it out there as quickly as possible. I will, would would say that even the process of saying, I'm going to take at least 10 minutes for this and I'm going to do at least three versions of it will make your display stronger. Make yourself write down three versions of it. Don't just think them, make yourself write down three versions of it and I will guarantee you will have stronger display as a result of it. And I'll show you some other tools as we go through this on ways to, to, to push yourself to do that a little bit more. Um, so, Analyze what works for you. If you are not already tracking this, you should be tracking. So track, look at the headlines on your, the, on your site that have um, the overall, look, headlines on your site, we're missing a word in there, uh, that have the overall highest performing story. So look at your overall highest performing stories. Look at the, what those were in the last week, in the last month, the last six months, the last year. What are your all time highest performing pieces. You should know what those are or you should be able to quickly find what those were. And you, you won't find what those were unless you're tracking that stuff on a regular basis. So track it, re reference it. 
look at what's performing best in organic search and do it again for those same kinds of timelines. You might want to adjust those time parameters based on your particular site as well. You might want to be looking at the last three days, last week, last month, last three months. Um, what's the highest performer in click-through from your newsletter, from newsletter headlines? So what's clicking through from headlines? What are people clicking through from Facebook posts? What are they clicking through from your Twitter posts and any other social media uh, platforms, LinkedIn, Instagram, WhatsApp, anything else that you're, you know, anything else that is potentially driving traffic to your site, look at what's performing well on those platforms. Also look at what is working well for others. What catches your eye and could something like this work for you? So make an inspiration file. I call it a swipe file. Um, just do a screen grab of it or, or keep a link or bookmark it or something, but do something to sort of provide yourself with a, a, you know, a place of inspiration to go to in those moments when you think I cannot write another headline. Uh, if you go into your swipe file, that can help. So uh, some headlines that are grabby. Malaysia's top cartoonist says he'll miss PM who tried to jail him for 43 years. Okay, I want to read that. I don't, I don't care about Malaysia. I don't care about cartoonists. I'm just saying that. I do care a little bit about Malaysia, but cartoonists not so much. Um, but you know, I'm intrigued enough by that headline that I'm going to click through on, on that because it, it promises a twist there. The clock is ticking. Here's how you can save your internet from censorship machines and the link tax. Um, the bottom one, I was Jordan Peterson's strongest supporter. Now I think he's dangerous. So, you know, all of those were stories that hooked me and that I grabbed the headlines for. Uh, so think about, you know, grabbing headlines that, that make you click and analyzing what's working about those. Uh, you know, in that bottom one, it's that moment of conversion and it helps that, you know, that person converted to my point of view. Uh, you know, so it's emphasizing, you know, the stuff that, that, that uh, creates our, or that, that re-emphasizes our own beliefs. We know that there's that sort of uh, bell jar effect of, of clicking on stuff that confirms what we already believe. Um, watch what works for you in newsletter links. This one, you know, treadmills were meant to be atonement machines. Of course they were. <laughs> yeah. And that image that goes along with it is also driving some of that. Um, so, you know, providing, and with that headline, it's providing, uh, you know, a new twist on, there's an emotional connection to that, right? There is that moment of, of course they were meant to be atonement machines. Nobody really wants to be on one. And then the historical info that's going to make me look a little bit smarter when I'm complaining about the step machine to the person on the step machine next to me. That's going to make me look smarter, right? Um, in email subject lines, what works? So uh, email subject line, what hell probably looks like. OK, I'm going to click through on that. I'm just going to be caught by that. Uh, in this one from Huff, HuffPost South Africa, uh, you know, using the, the emojis work there. Why I just three heart struggle credentials. I don't even know what struggle credentials is, but the three hearts draw my eye. Uh, the person's name, if I know, if they have some authority in my region or in my subject area, that may also uh, draw my name, draw my interest into that story. Um, an email from Canada Blood, Canadian Blood Services. It's personalized to the person it was sent to. Uh, the email subject line was Aaron, there are great appointment spots less than two weeks away. So it's personalized to me or to the person who received it. Um, and it's telling me, uh, providing clear benefit there, great appointment spots in this two week window. 24 hours to save BC's salmon. Immediacy, clarity, uh, the idea that I actually may be able to take some action that will make a positive impact on something. So all of those sort of drivers in those heads. Also more subject lines, they're breaking the internet tomorrow. I've thought it was broken for quite a long time. Uh, this one that actually uses the word breaking in it. So breaking EU vote threatens the internet. Uh, is living without Silicon Valley's big five even possible anymore? Again, that's appealing to that emotional 
piece that we've all had, you know, some frustration with the the big five, with the Googles, with the, the Twitters, with Facebook, all the rest of it. So is living without them even possible? I don't even have to know who the big five are because I'm creating my own big five list in my head. In terms of tweets, again, watching what catches your eye. I think Denise Belkasun from the Globe and Mail does a really terrific job on her uh, Twitter feed in terms of highlighting her own content, the, ma the newspaper's content, but also other content. So she does, an, and, and one of the things that she does really effectively is pulling a compelling quote out of the story. And so she's just quoted from the story here. Maddie tried harder and more relentlessly to stay sober than we've ever seen anyone try at anything. I get choked up just reading that, right? Um, and of course, part of the power of that post is that heartbreaking picture of mom and kid, right? Uh, and then you're seeing immediately uh, that it's an obituary uh, and some, some uh, quoted material from the obit. Uh, that got, you know, I mean, she, when I grabbed that, I think that post had only been up for maybe 45 minutes and she'd already had almost 1,000 likes on the post almost 300 shares and so and that story was everywhere over the course of that day uh, in this case uh, she's taken a story Panasonic designed human blinders to block out open plan office distraction I probably would have clicked on that story with that weird image anyway but then when you layer in Denise's comment is it weird to wear one to a meeting <laughs> Now I'm really going to click on it, right? Because there's just that sort of humor attached to it, and that's the right sort of humorous note for her to be able to take as a columnist, uh, where she might not be able to take quite the same level of humor if she were a straight reporter for a publication. On that story, probably she could, but on some other stories, that's a, a trickier line to walk if you're a reporter versus a columnist. This one made me laugh on all levels. so. The original post, Vox says hyenas are feminist, hyenas say what the fuck is feminism? <laughs> uh, a leading hyena researcher tells us what the research, not the myth, has to say. Great image of, you know, that, that I, hyena, I want to be the hyena feminist right there, that's what I want to be. And then the person who has posted it is also layering in her own take. Hyenas are smashing the pa patriarchy, or wait, no, they're crunching the long bones of gazelles maintaining their positions in dominance hierarchies and hell, having a hell of a time giving birth, another great piece from, uh, from the particular writer. So that's working on like three or four different levels there and of course I'm gonna click through uh, on that piece. <clears throat> this is an interesting strategy, um, using the parenthetical to insert attitude into a headline so that headline could have just been a brief history of I don't care that jacket that Melania wore two months ago three months ago but when you then bracket in a brief fascist history of I don't care now you're telling you're conveying some of the attitude of the piece uh, you're conveying some of the emotional uh, attitude of that piece so that I would argue that I, I'll bet you that a brief fascist history of I don't care would generate more clicks than a brief history of I don't care. So think about what you can measure and what you can test. Look at what has worked. Also look at where you've not had your best successes. Uh, often known as mistakes. Um, so look, look at what hasn't worked well and think about, okay, well, why did, try and do some analysis on what didn't work well. Sometimes there are factors beyond your control that you uh, posted something at the exact time that suddenly pipe bombs were being delivered to people or you posted something at just the moment that something blew up, uh, no, I didn't mean to say blew up, didn't actually blow up, that an issue uh, um, uh, emerged in parliament and, th and that got all, all kinds of coverage so your story sort of got pushed out of, of people's eyeball range. But do take a look at, at what your successes are, what, what some of your uh, least successful material has been and think about what what's working there. Check your stats uh, on a regular basis and see what's working. Keep a running list of your latest best performers. Keep a running list of other 
competitors and others' best performers. What can you be inspired by? What can you learn from? And look for opportunities to test different approaches. So we're going to talk a little bit about that later on, too. Um, develop your own brand-specific guidelines and recognize that they will evolve. So, you know, that huge list of, of industry best practices from the top that, uh, that we walked through, go through that and, and see what really applies to your content and tweak those best practices depending on what you're seeing in your own results. And then revisit that over time. See if that strategy that worked so well for you six months ago uh, is still working well for you and doesn't need to be updated or tweaked. You know, for a little while, uh, the you won't believe what happens next kind of construction worked really well. And then everybody thought, yeah, nothing happened next because all of these stories have no payoff. So that construction stopped paying off fairly quickly. OK, so uh, for about a minute, what, a two minutes, I'd like you to take a headline from somebody who's sitting next to you. And I'd like you to rewrite their headline as if it was for your brand. So I want you to shape shift a little bit. Take a headline from somebody who doesn't work on your brand and recast it as if it were your own. You can do that within the room, or you can take it from online. But it probably is quicker to turn to somebody who's sitting near you and say, give me a headline. OK, so um, I work basically in women's health and content around that. So uh, my neighbor here is from a live magazine, and she gave me a post on uh, staying mentally healthy as you age. Okay. So um, I reframed it as um, sort of around menopause because that's what we would immediately go for. Uh, so I went with menopause on your mind, staying mentally healthy in every cycle of your life. Um, how to keep your mind sharp through menopause. Seven self-care experts tell you how. Great. And brain and period running amok. These natural strategies will strengthen your brain. Nice. So, and you, so you've got some nice variation there in tone, right? And not, you know, some that have the number in it, some that have the expert promise in it. Um, and you'd want to think about the variation across what you're posting. We'll talk about this a little bit too, across what you're posting over the course of a day, over the course of a week, so that you're varying up the, the kind of sell you're doing on different kinds of stories. If your every story has three tips, seven tips, four experts, that's, that will stop working effectively for you because every story starts to sound the same. So you do want to introduce some difference across stories. But you've got three nice variations there that give you some opportunity to, to, to try different things out. And the thing is, when you come up with two or three strong headlines, you can always try one as the headline on the story and the other as the cell line on the tweet or on the Facebook post and see you know, how that one-two punch works for you as well. Anybody else want to share a couple of thoughts? Down here, great. Yes, you did make eye contact, it's true. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm with Pulp Literature Press and we do um, fiction, as Jen said. So I got a blog post from Academy Duello, which is the sword fighting school here in Vancouver. Um, and their title was To Build Proficiency, colon, Show Up. So I went with um, five habits every writer needs to master the craft. And in parentheses, number one shouldn't surprise you. OK, yeah, so there's a little bit of a a promise there. The other thing, the other, the other way that you could, t that could be an interesting way to play off their original content as well is playing off the unexpectedness of writing, getting writing, getting tips on what will work for writing from sword fighters or whatever, you know? So it's a, it's the kind of promise that, that uh, lots of publications have used to tell interesting stories. So one of the, one of the, the strongest 
uh, pieces I recall seeing in, I think it was Wired magazine, was the headline in a whole package about how to work more effectively. Uh, the headline was, it is brain surgery, stupid. And it was, <laughs> it was a story about how a brain surgeon stays calm during, calm and, and efficient and proficient during a 12 hour uh, surgery and what you can learn from that. So, you know, that one worked because it played off of a, a common saying. It also worked because it conveyed expertise from an unexpected expert. So playing off the unexpected expertise angle in your head could also be another way to, 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 to twist and play that, that particular content. Okay, so understand the platforms that you're also working on. Um, think about where your display copy is going to appear. If you're writing a headline, that headline's gonna appear on your website. Uh, it's gonna appear in your e-newsletter and it's probably gonna show up in your social media stuff as well. So understanding that it shows up in two or three different places is important for you to think about what works in those areas. On the website, the priorities are clarity and building in some keywords, but it's also worth recognizing that your SEO can be helped out by packing some of those keywords into your decks and other display copy. You don't have to put all of the keywords into your headline. Uh, you can get some, some um, uh, SEO uh, boosting out of the secondary headlines and other display. Um, where possible, as we said earlier, you do want to include proper names of the things that matter to your readers and to people who will be searching for that kind of content. So those may be proper names of places, they may be proper names of, of brands, of people, of anything that is unique to your particular audience. So there might be, for instance, particular kinds of acronyms or processes that are important to your audience that would mean nothing to somebody else, but having that in your headline or in your display copy uh, could be of value to the kinds of readers you're trying to attract. I'm thinking, you know, if you were uh, a, a publication aimed at HR professionals, um, tagging something with Myers-Briggs might be of more value to them than you would, you might not use that, that specific um, uh, label in other content in other situations. Um, as we've said, avoid puns, avoid oblique references, avoid obscure words, and do try to differentiate it from other similar content on your website. If you're covering the same topic over and over again, go back to see what you've done before so that the story doesn't feel like a complete repeat. In your e-newsletter, uh, you're going to have e content showing up in your e-newsletter subject line. Recognize that for most folks now, you know, we're not checking that, e we're not checking our email as much on our desktops, we're checking it more on the fly. So your reader's gonna be checking that stuff on their phone or their mobile device. Um, think about that, how is it going to display on that mobile device? Uh, they're going to be time pressed and making quick decisions. What's going to intrigue them? What's going to motivate them? What's going to make them not delete that message immediately? In your e-newsletter, can you come up with a subject line that promises to solve a problem, to fulfill a need, to answer some sort of question? Those are all the sort of basic elements that we were talking about for uh, display copy overall. But it does, in the e-newsletter e subject lines, especially given how time-pressed and burdened everyone feels by their uh, e uh, email inboxes, it becomes even more important. How can you convey that there's something of value to me there? Um, and remember, under that fulfill a need, remember that being better informed or ahead of the crowd is a need, okay? That ability to provide authoritative content that's going to make me smarter, better at my work, better in my social circle, that is an, a status need that we have, uh, that your readers have. So uh, being better informed, being the person who knows who the up and coming uh, fiction writers are, that's important to your audience. Being the person who uh, is ahead of the curve on what the most important bills passing through your provincial legislature next week, not the ones that passed last week, that's important to certain types of audiences. So think about what motivates them. 
Can you signal or trigger emotional engagement? So we've talked about using certain kinds of words, playing to people's emotions, uh, um, connecting with people's emotions along the way. Um, is in, within the newsletter itself, so once you've gotten past the subject line, within your e-newsletter itself, think about what the overall goals for your e-newsletter are. Uh, it may be, your e-newsletter may be driven by a couple of things. Y yes, you may want to drive clicks back to your website. Is that the primary reason for your e-newsletter? Or for your particular audience, is it, import is it enough that you are simply providing them with content within the e-newsletter and, and it's all right if they don't click through? That they're getting value and establishing connection with you. The fact you know, we've typically tended on e-newsletters to say, oh, look at the open rate, look at the click-through rate, and you want the click-through rate to be really high or somehow you failed. But from your reader's perspective, you may have delivered enough value to me in just scanning the e-newsletter that I didn't need to click through, and so I'm still feeling really connected to you as a brand. From a brand's perspective, if you really need to get the eyeballs onto your website to deliver eyeballs to ads on your website, you might want to look at tweaking how, what, how you're packaging that content in the e-newsletter so that you're not delivering all the value in the e-newsletter and you're compelling them to click through. It's, it, it's a, a bit of a dance, but it's worth recognizing that that scanning readers still often feel that they're getting value from the content that you're providing them, even if they don't click through to your site. Um, for each social media platform, you're going to want to think about what the norms for that platform are. So the norms on Twitter are different from the norms on Facebook, are different from the norms on LinkedIn, are different from the norms on Instagram. So each one of those is its own particular environment and you're going to want to give some thought and tweak content so that it suits the particular environment that you're operating within. Uh, you do not want to just take one social media headline and repeat it across all platforms. You won't get good results from that. You also want to think about what the boundaries are of your brand or your publication's appropriate tone because there are tonal differences from platform to platform. You can get away with being edgier on Twitter. You can get away with being swearier on Twitter um, in a way that you might not on Facebook. But is that appropriate for your brand? So you need to look both at the at sort of the tonal environment of that platform and then where your brand or your publication's comfort zone is within that tonality, okay? And thinking about, again, how are you going to break through all of the noise and the, the, some of the tips that we've talked about earlier apply to all of that. Six out of 10 people share links to stories they haven't even read, OK? And we've all done it. So don't shake your head, because I know you've done it. <laughs> you know, we've all done it, right? We've shared links to something that we're compelled to just by the headline, um, and we haven't read the content. And that's OK but recognize that that happens. Uh, and so having a successful headline can get, get your content shared more widely. Um, but you know, if, the, if the goal is to actually drive traffic back to your website, you want to try to find some ways to hook them into the story so they're not just sharing the link. And some of that can uh, come in in all of the things that we've talked about in building the promise of benefit and building curiosity so that I'm not just going to share the link, I'm going to click through to the link. Okay. Um, for timing, I'm not going to, we're not going to do this exercise, but I want you to try this at home. So I want you to take one of your headlines uh, and write a Facebook post promoting it and write a tweet promoting it. So just take those headlines and do a little bit of work on that front. Okay, so let's talk about audience. Think about who your audience and is and what those audience segments are. So a lot of us, when we start talking about audience, we talk about the raw demographics of our audience, right? We talk about that our audience is women 35 to 45, or it's uh, men over uh, 50, or it's 
uh, retirees or it's, hip, uh, yeah, it's uh, university students age 18 to 25. Uh, we talk about where they live. We talk about what their income levels are. That's helpful, but it isn't complete. It doesn't give you a clear enough picture, really, of what some of the things that will motivate your audience are. So it's worth thinking about how do I define those audience segments in more compelling and emotional ways. Brands that have lots of money do this through psychographics and, and go with deep dives on all kinds of focus testing and all of the rest of it to develop a, a, a psychographic profile of different kinds of readers. But you can do this with your gut as well. So if you're thinking that your audience is women aged 35 to 45, there are lots of ways to slice and dice that audience. At Chatelaine, we used to think about our audience as being composed of three segments, doers, dreamers, and thinkers. Okay, So the doers were the ones who were motivated really heavily by the service content and by the recipes. The thinkers were the ones who were really moved by the long read content. And the dreamers were the ones who loved the visual content of the beauty and the fashion and the home decor stuff. So if I'm thinking about my audience as being doers, dreamers, and thinkers, suddenly I'm thinking about how I'm going to package content in different ways. Uh, if I'm going to do uh, a big um, home decor piece and I want to try and appeal across segments, I'm going to have great juicy photographs for the dreamer, but I'm going to have some checklists and sidebar content that tells the doer how to get this look, right? Um, if I'm doing a full package on, um, let's see, if I'm doing a full package on getting your dream job for that audience, I'm going to include in that package some real checklisty type content for the doer. I'm going to include a first person memoir piece for the dreamer, for, or for the, yeah, for the, sorry, for the thinker the person who wants to sort of be emotionally connected to the storytelling. And then for the dreamer, I'm going to include some content on uh, the best, uh, best um, uh, interview outfits with some lovely luscious photography in there. So again, slicing and dicing your audience by the type of person they are rather than just their age, height, and weight <laughs> is going to help you get there. Another way to slice and dice that women 35 to 45 audience would be by their relationship status. Are they empty nesters, new moms, single and happy, single and wishing they weren't, okay? And you know, it used to be that we could define new moms by an age range. You can't do that anymore because you could be a first time mom at 18 or you could be a first time mom at 44. So defining them by age doesn't help you, but defining them by life stage can help you, okay? Another way to slice and dice that women 35 to 45 audience is by how they're approaching their work life. So are they corporate climbers, new entrepreneurs, savvy business owners, starting fresh? So thinking about what motivates your reader, how your reader's uh, goals and aspirations align with the content that you're providing, and trying to sort of define them by mindset as opposed to just by demographic, will be helpful in helping you um, target their target content that will hit emotional buttons with them. So once you've done a little bit of that, that then allows you to start thinking about, OK, what makes particular kinds of content useful to particular slices of that audience? What's going to make it compelling to them? And some stories may be tipped more to one audience than another. But many stories will appeal to multiple portions of your audience. And you'll be looking at those audience slices to help you pitch that story to different segments of your audience. So you may find, for instance, that if, you're, if you've got the doers, the dreamers, and the thinkers, that when you're posting to Pinterest, you're really focused on the dreamers, because they're focused on the lush visual stuff. Or some of the, that Pinterest crowd is also the doers, the people who create the lists and the packages of stuff to inspire them. So you might be, be targeting them there. 
uh, whereas with the thinkers, you might be targeting them more by playing up your juicier uh, long reads on Facebook or on Twitter. So thinking about where those different kinds of audience segments, what kinds of social media platforms they're more likely to be on. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is take one of your headlines and write three different tweets, each aimed at a different segment of your audience. So I want you to, it means you have to sort of think about who your audience is and come up with three different segments of your audience and write a tweet for each one of those segments, and we'll take about three or four minutes for that. Um, so I'm from Page One Publishing, and we do a couple different publications, but one of them is a business publication called mm -hmm. Douglas Magazine. Um, we just did a piece on the Victoria childcare crisis, okay. um, and it was aimed at the, the solutions that businesses are um, presenting for the crisis. Um, and I came up with a couple different ones. So the Victoria childcare crisis, get informed on how local businesses are working to solve the problem. Uh, that would be more on the people who are looking at our pieces for like information. Um, having trouble with finding childcare, you are not alone. Check out the businesses working to find solutions. And that's more for, we have a lot of like families that mm -hmm. read it and it is local. So it's in like coffee shops and stuff. Yeah. Um, and then the last one would be more aimed at like the actual businesses, um, which would be how you and your business can create solutions to the local childcare crisis. Great. Yeah, so three very clearly defined audiences, same story, spun nicely for each one. I would, uh, just as you were reading them, just one way to tighten up instead of get informed about, the reader knows that they're going to get informed, so you could pull that piece out of there and you're saving yourself three words. Yeah. Anybody else want to share their three variations? Dan here. So um, a lot of our readers are women, mm -hmm. mostly for marketing directors of these commercial properties. Yeah. So the headline that I would start with was, um, who's looking after your brand while you're on mat leave? Because oh. there's a lot of turnover through yeah. mat leave, because they're all women between 30 and 50, yeah. sort of. So one version of a tweet would be, uh, have you found a mall sitter while you're off on mat leave? Nice. Uh, second one was going off on mat leave, seven items for your marketing to-do list. And the third one was going off on mat leave, Cadillac Fairview's marketing VP on preparing your comeback. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got three different ways of taking it. Nice mall sitters, a nice phrase in there because you're, I mean, I get it and I'm not your target audience. Your target audience would definitely get it, right? Um, and some nice play there in playing up the numbers versus, and, uh, and the strategies versus uh, other approaches. So nicely done. Okay. So voice and tone. Difference between voice and tone. Voice stays fairly consistent over time and platform. So your brand's voice stays pretty consistent across all places. The tone can shift slightly depending on the audience, the platform, and the message. So when you think about it in a human way, your individual character, your individual voice stays fairly consistent as you move through the world. But the voice, the, the tone of your voice in a business meeting is slightly different from the tone of your voice, the, the content, the way that you share things uh, in after dinner drinks with friends versus on the weekend versus in a job interview. So you're the same person in all of those four settings, but the way you communicate shifts slightly depending on what setting you're in, okay? So voice stays relatively constant, tone can shift. So it's worth thinking about what the voice of your brand is, and it can be really helpful to try and define that in three words. Uh, when you look at brand descriptions of voice, often you'll see great long paragraphs no one can retain the great long paragraph description of what your brand voice is. But most of us can retain at least two out of three words, okay? So think about what your brand voice is. And I would say start off by picking three out of a great big list like this. Are you uh, straight laced? Are you rebellious? Is your voice serious? Is it feisty? Is it relaxed? Pick two or three words that apply to your particular brand, okay? Uh, you'll be able to, if you don't want to do that right now, you'll, this list will be in the deck and you'll be able to choose some uh, from there. 
it's also worth thinking about what isn't your voice. What is the, what, where is your voice definitely not going to go? So picking three words out of a, out of a set uh, that can help define who you are not in your expression of your brand. Are you not lighthearted? Are you not old fashioned? Are you not straight laced? For some brands, being straight laced is a positive word. For other brands, being straight laced is a negative word. So think about what your positive voice words are and what your negative voice words are. Then it's worth thinking about how that tone shifts as you move on to different platforms. So once you've captured what your voice is in those kinds of descriptors, it's worth then defining what the tone is and what the tonal shift is on your website. Your website's probably going to be pretty close to your voice words, right? But your tone for Twitter might have 10% more humor attached to it, might have 10% more edge attached to it. So how does your funny tone, funny voice shift on Twitter? Maybe it shifts from funny to sarcastic, or maybe that's too big a leap for your brand. Maybe it shifts from funny to ironic, and that's okay for your brand on Twitter. So think about what that tonal shift is as you move on to different platforms. What's your tone on Facebook? Facebook tends to be um, uh, a little bit friendlier and more conversational, uh, but not as edgy and not as feisty, as pokey as Twitter tends to be. So because your Facebook posts are showing up in people's feeds with their family photographs and uh, high school best friend update, you know, so you're, you want to live in the right tonal environment. So think about w taking those voice words and then shifting them slightly for how they then apply in each one of your social media platforms. Okay, we're going to finish off by talking about how do you build your muscles along the way. We did talk earlier about building a swipe file. So fill it with examples of headlines uh, that have made you click along the way. When you are working on a particular story and struggling with a headline or how to shape it, Google that subject matter and see what kind of headlines others have used. And see what kind, it, that will surface words, that will surface angles that you may not have thought about in how to, how to do that. Um, check what's working, what, check your keywords. So uh, one way to check your keywords, a really simple way, is to use Google Autocomplete. But before you do that, you need to, to reset your search settings. Do people know that when you search on Google, it's generally giving you search results that are targeted to you specifically? So it's tracking your past search history and giving you results that align with the kind of stuff you're interested in. So if you want to change your search settings from private results, which find stuff that are aimed, stuff that's aimed particularly at you, to more general results, the general results that the broader audience would get, you need to, in search, go under settings, click on search settings, and then under private results, click on to do not use private results. Because otherwise, all of the Google, uh, all of the autocomplete words that come up as you start to do search will be tailored specifically to you and not to the wider audience, okay? So once you've done that, then you can start entering your keywords into just the Google search and see what other keywords come up associated with that. Uh, and that can give you some thoughts on what else you might want to include as keywords if it aligns with your story. This can also be a way of prompting some story ideas for you. So uh, if you do a search of university student, resume, jobs, budget, discounts, this is the, the search, the, the, the range of search terms that come up that are associated with the words university student. That tells me lots of people are searching for university student resume, university student jobs. Um, if I'm not already doing content like that and I'm in, in a publication aimed at university students, I'm going to think about layering in some of that kind of content. So use autocomplete. Again, if I just type in best dance, 
this is the kind of stuff that's going to come up for me, okay? It is, you'll see best dance clubs in Halifax, even turning off private results, it's going to geo-target me because I did that search in Halifax. Other tools, so I'm going to hand out a uh, handout, a handout. It's very handy when you hand out a handout. So that's the handout on some ways of, uh, some sites to check. Again, you'll be able to see, some of, see this in the deck when it comes out to you. But using Google Trends, you can check on Google Trends to see what kind of, of uh, content is trending in the moment. So trends.google.com. And once you type in a trend, it will show you where the peaks and valleys are in interest over the last year. So I just typed in the word dance. And from October 2017 to October 2018, fairly steady line, except there's a big spike in dance in February. I don't know why. Uh, I think, as I dug a little bit deeper, that it might be connected to ice dancing. So it's showing where some variation is along the line. So that's showing you where the trending is around particular search terms. It will also tell you what kind of search terms people are searching for in different regions. You can set the region to Canada, you can set it to the US, you can set it to different countries and see what's trending. What's also valuable is that you can compare terms. And this is helpful in constructing your headlines. So I searched for student jobs and got this graph of cert. This is the search volume for the term student jobs. Then I plugged in student careers. That's the search volume for student careers. Well, given that, I'm definitely going to use the term student jobs in my headline rather than student careers because there's a lot more vo search volume associated with that. You can also poke into adwords.google.com. It will ask you to set up an account uh, and it will ask you to define a budget. You don't actually have to spend any money to use the tool. It just, you know, plug in $5. It won't actually charge you $5. Um, but you can st enter search terms and it will start, it will pull up associated search terms uh, and you can see what kind of vol search volume certain words are getting so that you again can think, okay, well, student jobs is generating more search volume again than student careers. After school work is generating relatively little, second jobs is generating a lot more than after school work. So, thinking about what, what the volume is can point you to words that you might want to layer into some of your display copy along the way. You can also use Google Correlate. Um, so that's at google.com slash trends slash correlate. Again, set what country you want to be doing the uh, searches in. And if you type in a word, it will tell you other words, again, that are associated with that search term. So, uh, the word refugee in Canada associated with Syrian, with help refugees, with how many Syrian refugees, that sort of thing. And it's also showing you that over the last you know, period from 2007 onwards, not a lot of volume in traffic, but then a huge surge around the time of the Syrian refugee crisis. That's not, uh, not unexpected. So you'll get some value out of that. One site that can be really helpful in looking for search terms across a whole bunch of sites is suval.com. And what they'll do is pull forward uh, associated search terms on all of those sites. So Google, Amazon.com, Yahoo, Bing, YouTube, Answers.com, and Wikipedia. So if I type in refugees, it's going to tell me what the associated search terms are on all of those other sites for the word refugees. And so now, if I'm creating video content, that gives me some guidelines about what search terms people are looking for on YouTube associated with refugee versus what they're looking for uh, in a regular Google search or on a Yahoo search or a Bing search. Okay. Another site is Uber Suggest. Uh, it's done by Neil Patel, who's a online marketer who, if you've ever clicked on anything about online marketer, he will show up in your feeds for the rest of your life. Um, but it's, uh, it is a useful tool. So if you, again, type in 
um, a search term. You can choose a language which is helpful. So if you're, if you're communicating in more than one language, you can choose language and region uh, and do a search based on that. So that, for the term student loans, tells me what the search volume is, that it's relatively easy to uh, get good SEO results by using that term, tells me what the search volume is, and some other associated words along the way. So again, all ways just to sort of increase the words in your bucket, in your toolkit, as you're trying to do these headlines. Then, here's where we get into some fun in terms of testing headlines. Uh, AM uh, Institute, the Advanced Marketing Institute, has a headline analyzer. Uh, and so you can type in your headline and they will rank it, they'll give it a score, and they'll tell you whether it tips towards being an intellectual and empathic or a spiritual headline. That might be of value to you depending on what your audience segments are. But more than anything, it's a really great way to compete against yourself because I'll tell you, you will enter a headline and you'll think, oh, I only got a 33, I gotta try harder than that. And you'll enter another and you'll enter another and another and it will help you see, uh, help you build your skills in creating additional headlines. So for instance, I did the headline six tip for student job hunters and it got a score of 33. When I, when I switched that to resumes that work, six strategies for student job hunters, it popped up to 55. What does that number really mean? Who really knows? But it's telling me that there's there's some further strength in that headline. And again, it's based on broad results. Your results may vary. What works for your site may not be exactly aligned with what they're saying is going to work, but it does help push you to do some more work on your headlines. Similar sort of site is coschedule.com's headline analyzer. Coschedule.com is another marketing firm. They've sort of taken the AM Institute headline analyzer and added some of their own special sauce to it. Uh, it's still free. You pro I think you have to register an email address for it to get access. But you type in your headline. What I like about this one is that it keeps a running list of your headline scores. So I did six tips for student job hunters, resumes that work, six strategies, and it bumped up, then it bumped down, then I got a bump up, another bump down, and kept working away. So it, gave, it saved all of my 10 or 12 attempts at summer job related content. And I can then scan and see, okay, get your best summer job ever real life tips is the one that scored the highest out of that mix. And it does just keep pushing you to work a little bit harder. So, you know, using those two tools t to compete against yourself and see if you can improve your top score will really help along the way. And the key really is practice, practice, practice. As you write more headlines, as you write more display copy, you will get better at it. But I would always say that where you can, where you have the time to, take at least two swings at the ball. Don't just be satisfied with your first headline, see if you can tweak it, see if you can improve it. And if you've got time to you know, do two or three or four iterations, you're going to find stronger headlines, stronger display copy. If you are stuck, that's when you dip into your swipe file. Another thing is if you're stuck, swap headlines with somebody else in your office or somebody else that you're working with. Just a fresh set of eyes on what you're doing will help along the way. So, any questions? We have eight minutes. <laughs> any questions? Yeah, over here. That might have just been a, okay, that wasn't that. You, you, just, you just bid on, the, uh, on what was up for auction at the front. Thank you so much. This you're has welcome. been really helpful. Um, I did have one question. The way we organize our website is that we have um, the title, obviously, of the article mm -hmm. in the print publication, and then we kind of recraft it for our website to right. make it more SEO friendly, make it more explanatory. Often, it's just like two words or something on the in print. Yeah. Um, so we want to make it more uh, have more informa information. But then putting it on social media, 
then that's almost like a third iteration of yeah. display media. So for each of those, it needs to get more and more kind of explanatory. But I'm curious when we're kind of going through all these examples, would you say that's more for the iteration that's going to go on the website um, or for the one that's going to go on social media? So uh, I'm, I'm actually not exactly, so when you, I'm not exactly sure what your question was. So when you're saying tweaking your headline, that you want to tweak it more for headline or for social? Yeah, I yeah. guess more the question would be, um, there's the caption of the actual um, social media right. post, and right. then there's the title of the article, right. and just how those two are different and how you can relate them and not just be repeating the same information. Yeah. So recognize that, that when you are posting the link to that story, that the title that's on your website generally is going to populate into uh, an image with that headline. So you do want to look at what the interplay between those two things is. You don't want to repeat word for word the headline that you have on the story. So that's where the opportunity comes in to play up some other benefit. If you're hitting a really heavy um, service angle on the headline for the story on your website, there might be then an opportunity to hit an emotional angle in the uh, social media post again depending on the social media post and whether it's you know whether that's appropriate for that platform but look for a way to plus what you've already done um, and that's where working on two or three or four versions of a headline can help because if you keep track of what those versions were in a file when you go back to do your social media post you might have the right social media post already at your fingertips it was one of your headline alternates that you came up with for the story so in a world where we all have to work more efficiently keeping a file of what your what your alternate headlines were can also be useful because you may be able to reuse those on social does that make sense yeah, yeah. over here I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about hashtags and how many to put in and where to put them, like in the text or at the end. Yeah. So I'm very conflicted on hashtags. Um, you know, I think first of all, people go hashtag crazy, and you can end up with social media posts that are so hashtag heavy it's almost impossible to read the post. Um, it's worth asking yourself. How are, are people really going to search for this content by the hashtag? So if you are covering something that is breaking news, you might want to include a hashtag because it's associated with a particular event or a particular uh, keyword. Um, but And if you are creating your own event that you want people to search for your content by or, or converse via, in a you know in a in a Twitter stream, then yes, you might want to attach a particular uh, hashtag because you're having a conversation about best writing tips or something like that. Then hashtagging it best writing tips or hashtagging it as pulp best writing tip or something like that. Hopefully fewer characters than that, um, so that people can follow your particular conversation around it. Then that can be a value, but. I mean, the reality is people, dep it depends on your audience segment, but people don't really often click the hashtag to see everything that's under hashtag me too. I mean, you know, it, it, we, we use them in sort of a default way sometimes and do them because we're expected to, but it's worth asking yourself, is this really providing benefit to the person who's reading this in terms of them being able to track a whole bunch of stories that are, or tweets or, or posts that are related to a similar topic. What's the usefulness of that hashtag? And sometimes hashtags do get in the way of readability. So uh, I would be very cautious about using more than two or three hashtags unless you're in a very specific audience that has a high hashtag tolerance. I would bet for your audience I would be keeping my hashtags fairly minimal, except in situations where I want to create, make it easy for people to take part in a, a live conversation or a conversation over time about a specific topic. Yeah, does that make sense? Any other questions? Yeah. Well, I would love, I don't know if you have time to do this, but um, I would love to hear more about how you landed with, um, doers, dreamers, 
you know, oh, the Jewish graphics. dreamers and thinkers. I mean, so in that process, we did uh, we did bring in some outside uh, research assistants, uh, and they did a whole series of focus groups for us and and a lot of, of reader interview stuff and reader mostly they did mostly focus groups, um, and and exploring what sort of benefits people were looking for on the page. And really, it was interesting because, uh, you know, it captured what we knew intuitively anyway. We were already delivering a package that had lots of great visuals, lots of how-to, and some stuff that appealed to the intellect. Um, but that became a, a nice way of, of being able to communicate especially being able to communicate uh, outside of the editorial team about who our readers were. Um, others have done it more intuitively and with less investment in focus groups because that focus group investment probably, I'm going to say, was around $150,000 worth of research. Um, so, you know, we don't, and, and I bet you even now, Chatelaine would have trouble getting $150,000 worth of research uh, money to do that. But you can do it intuitively. So, for instance, um, a colleague worked, uh, was, was the editor-in-chief of a gardening magazine. And as she looked at what differentiated her gardening publication from other gardening publications in the market, she knew from reader response and from reader feedback and from interactions at uh, trade events and in social media that her readers sort of broke down into two groups, people who really, really, really like to get uh, into the gardening stuff themselves and people who treated gardening like decor. So she then realized that her audience sort of broke down into uh, people who had dirt under their fingernails and people who had French manicures, you know? And that was their, that was their two audiences. And she had those two audiences to appeal to. So part of it is sort of getting to know your reader through the interactions that you're having with your reader. Some of the challenge is that some of your audience may, may be getting high value from your publication but not interacting with you audibly. So there might be you know, sort of the silent happy readers out there that you're not getting a good uh, read from because they're not as vocal. We tend to target the vocal uh, as the world that we live in currently tells us. So um, you know, it's worth seeing what kind of reader profile emerges out of the interactions you're having and then ask yourself, is there any segment of our audience that we might be missing in this who are still getting value from us? Um, you know, I think that generally, if you think in general terms about different ways to appeal to your audience, most of us are looking for some mix of stuff that appeals to our head and stuff that appeals to our hearts. So, you know, what intellectual buttons are you trying to push with your audience and what emotional buttons are you trying to push with your audience and that will help provide a little bit of insight into that psychographic stuff as well. Great. Thank you everybody. Thank you.